<laughs> hey everyone, we're going to get started. Thanks so much for coming. I'm Lucina Schell. This is Approaching Wholeness in Another Language, Translating Poetic Fragments. And um, we're really excited to see you all here. We don't have one yet. Uh, do oh, there's no mic. The no. They should come. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it would be great if people. I don't think closer. we can project our voices all the way back to where the, the back of you guys are. It feels great. so fragmentary. <laughs> you feel fragmentary. I'm <laughs> poetic. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. so cu please come down to, down to the front. We don't have a mic. Um, there are handouts in the back, so please grab them. Everyone has a handout. Beautiful. Um, so we're trafficking in fragments, and um, I think everyone's uh, fragments that they're presenting on are certainly going to be poetic, but they're <laughs> not all strictly poetry, so that's exciting. And I'll just have the uh, panelists introduce themselves briefly. So let's go this way. I start? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Geda Murad. I'm a PhD candidate in comparative literature at uh, UC Irvine. Uh, I, I am also a, a fellow in literary translation. I translate from Arabic and French into English. Um, I uh, I work on Arabic and Francophone literature of the Middle East and North Africa. So when I translate from French, I mainly translate uh, North African uh, writers and poets. Hi, I'm Susan Bernofsky. I translate from German. I specialize in modernist literature and also contemporary. So mostly 20th century. I teach in the creative writing program at Columbia University. And my name is Yvette Siegert. I translate from the Spanish, uh, lately mostly Latin American Spanish, but also peninsular literature, also more 20th century poetry and fiction. And I'm not affiliated with the university, but uh, that's all. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kane Cheshire. I'm a, I teach Greek and Latin at Davidson College in, North, in Davidson, North Carolina. I uh, translated uh, primarily from ancient Greek. Uh, I have a uh, recent uh, recent work is a translation of Sophocles. If you look under S in the book fair, uh, it's, a, it's Sophocles' uh, Women of Trachis, and it's retitled uh, Murder at Jagged Rock. So you might not think it's Sophocles at first. But the um, I speak first, so I'm going to go ahead and stand up. And start. It's just this works out sort of as an introduction to the whole topic, I think. I is to talk about just this opera story of a sapphic song uh, and sort of take this little Prezi path uh, all the way from uh, its original context uh, forward through its uh, a kind of fragment, different ways of uh, receiving fragments or acquired fragments, but through a papyrus fragment uh, from Egypt and then uh, moving into its uh, into it, the, I, the whole concept of the edition, and then finally uh, the various ways that those uh, edited fragments might then be translated by a variety of translators. Now, move pretty, I'm going to turn something that could be an hour lecture uh, into something much much shorter, but I think we'll... Um, yeah. you're going to have to stand up right I don't know, I'll just... Oh, okay. Maybe this will work, actually. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. The first is um, <laughs> This is a sort of potentially idealized representation of the, probably necessarily idealized representation of Sappho. It was coming from the end of the, of the, of the fifth century uh, in Athens, so in a different state or nation, if you will, uh, from uh, from Lesbos, where Sappho was actually from, and coming 200 years later after, right? So you see her represented here looking at a text, which is potentially problematic. We don't know Sappho was literate, even. Uh, it's not necessary, uh, such an oral culture of poetry is such an oral phenomenon, formative phenomenon in antiquity, that one need necessarily be literate uh, to be a composer of poetry. Slaves, friend, uh, could read to you, uh, for example. Um, but by this time, there's the idea that Sappho should certainly be literate, and, and many works have been written down, uh, and writing to some extent is even a process, perhaps, of composition 
uh, by this point. We see tragedians in Athens being represented similarly on face paintings uh, in a seat with a scroll uh, in front of them. But this is to point out that um, how far removed Sappho and the experience of poetry is from our own uh, or song. I even call this a Sappho song uh, because almost all of her poems, very much, very likely to poem, all of her poems would have been performed, not read, never read silently. Alphabetical letters were invented, but not spaces between words, not punctuation. It was always performative, whether you do it yourself and discover what's on the page by hearing it, uh, or have others perform it, which is more common. Um, and when performed, they're very often in cultic contexts, uh, in formal, formal and formalized occasions, or say, for example, in, uh, in wedding contexts. So moving on to fragments, we're gonna, this is one page of fragments from Oxyricus, a city in Egypt, uh, which has a tremendous trash dump, garbage dump, that was used for a thousand years. West of the Nile River, higher ground, so that the, the papyrus didn't, uh, didn't decay for the most part. And I'm gonna zoom in on one of these <laughs> for a sapphic fragment. Uh, and you can see the Greek lettering here. You can see how truly fragmentary this is. Uh, this is labeled P. Oxy for Papyrus Oxyrhynchus, 1787, uh, also named 2166 D1. <laughs> First published in 1944, so this is part of the process. This is found and it's published uh, by someone deals, published it. Uh, then you get later editions uh, coming out that try to compile all the known fragments of Sappho, and usually Sappho's pairs with Alcius also from the island of Lesbos, the male poet of the island. I was the most contemporary at first. Uh, I've highlighted in kind of pink what I think is really significant. First of all, the dates. As we move forward, we've discovered more and more staff when I'll see this, so we get newer editions. Uh, but also, and also on the other side, we get different fragment numbers. Uh, so by the Hellenistic time, uh, we've got Sappho divided up, not necessarily for the ritual occasion, uh, and her poetry was orally composed for. Uh, but and orally performed for, but rather uh, according to uh, nine books, nine books for each of the nine uses, Sappho was known as the tenth muse, uh, and they were metrically divided. So the meter of the poetry just defines what, which book, one through nine, uh, poetry was in, or what the ten poetry was in. So uh, moving forward from that to the text, we get here an example of papyrus being converted in a very scholarly fashion to an edited text. I'm gonna zoom in on this edited text so we're gonna let go of the real thing, or one representation of the real thing, for this representation of the representation of the real thing. So you can see certain devices are used here. Brackets show where the fragments, uh, where nothing else occurs to the right or left. Uh, there are dots to show that their letters were there. If we're not sure about what those letters were, dots are placed under the letters. So you have these subscripted dots there to show that we're not really sure about those letters. You can see there's a lot of uncertainty in this tiny, tiny fragment of Sappho's. Below we have Testimonia. Uh, Scott published scholarship on, the, on, the, on this particular fragment. Places where phrases from the fragment occur in the Iliad or the Odyssey, the big capital letters such as, uh, as gamma refer to the Iliad, lowercase Greek letters such as kappa refer to book 11 of the Odyssey. Okay. Then critical, the apparatus criticus. <laughs> Scholars have proposed different readings for these supposed correct readings of the original fragment, okay, of the papyrus fragment. So then we move to new poems. Okay, so this is coming from 1982. If anyone's familiar with the Lowe Classical Library, yeah. uh, David Campbell has, uh, has, pu has published the translation of those in 1982. And you can see this. I'm not, this isn't a qualitative uh, sort of evaluation of the translations here that I'm going for. What I want to do is show you differences in the way that the fragments are handled and brought forward. So this is a scholar uh, trying to offer a very literal translation of the original. We get question marks afterwards that he's not sure about. We get an ellipsis everywhere that something's missing. Okay? Uh, Aegis bearing, well, that's an epithet of Zeus, so maybe Zeus, parentheses, question mark. Uh, Kitharia, maybe Kitharia, but we're missing the cap the, in the Upsilon, we can't be too sure, and a footnote, oh, this could be Aphrodite, he was associated. Uh, with, with Kitharia and so on. Um, below here is this is by Ann Carson, okay, on the right. Not 2002, uh, and I've offered you the Greek on the left. 
kind of the lie, but it can't hold it well for it. You can sort of see where they've departed. So the style, I don't think it's unimportant, but Carson has chosen to have open brackets only to the left. So there's something aesthetic and visual going on here. Uh, but don't be misled, right? Everything to the right is also missing. Right, which one may not necessarily know without reading carefully the introduction. Uh, and Carson, of course, is a scholar. I'm aware of this. The, um, we've got quiet within Egypt, skip the I pray, holding the heart. Some of the language has changed. Uh, holding the heart rather than something more like having in heart, which Campbell takes as with Holy Spirit being characterized in some way as an emotion. Uh, and forsaking is stronger than leaving. Uh, harsh is stronger than difficult. Uh, and it, the, those words have those full semantic ranges. Neither is incorrect. Uh, but it's a different way of representing a fragment, which is point. And then more recently, uh, Willis Barnstone in 2006. Is he here today? I had a panel on Thursday, actually, which talked about, um, but I'm not, I couldn't make it because I was on another panel at the same time. But it was speaking about um, uh, translation uh, without knowledge of the original source language. But Barstow collaborates closely with the classicists as well. And what's really interesting here is we've moved away from brackets entirely by this point. We've got anyone coming to this without an understanding of the fragment uh, would think we have a full poem for it. We even get a title from Barstow as well, right? Days of Harshness. Uh, and, and, and further interpretation can come to my severities. Severities couldn't be an accusative plural direct object in the original fragment the way it's an impossibility. Uh, but we get another level or another movement away from fragment into poem. And a different kind of perception. Uh, finally, I just wanted to refer really quickly to just the new contexts. Uh, I already mentioned the different fragment numberings. Uh, each of these, Campbell, Carson, and Barstow, all have arranged their fragments in different words. Uh, so that the, the fragments, these are fragments. And when fragments follow upon fragments, fragments are received differently relative to one another, not the reader, necessarily. Uh, so these are just an example of three different of the fragments that follow that all very different. Yeah. I think I'll just zoom, finish with zooming in on a modern statue of Sappho <laughs> at Middellini, her hometown. Uh, with the graffiti, I don't want to talk about the graffiti now, I don't think there's time. <laughs> but I can dig really deeply into that text. <laughs> <laughs> to the rest of the panelists we're going to be talking about contemporary fragmentation, which is of course more intentional. So uh, by way of introduction to that, I just wanted to offer some ideas about reasons that writers would choose to write intentionally in fragments. Um, and these are borrowed from an essay by Donald Rebell called Better Unsaid on Poetic Fragments of Micro Essay. Do you like it? Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing essay, um, and it's really brief and, and concise and wonderful. So um, do look for it. It's widely available. Available. So um, as Kane was kind of getting us into, fragments are, of course, um, robbed of context, even in the historical sense. Sappho's, Sappho's poetry or, or lyrics were obviously complete <coughs> narratives, and now they exist as fragments that context is gone. When writers choose to write in fragments today, we're also missing that sense of context. And I think as translators, we can try to kind of imagine what it is or approximate it, but it's missing. Fragments have no beginning or end. We can think of them as kind of pieces of middles. I think that's a nice way to think about them. Um, and so Ravel, uh, I'm just gonna gloss over a few of these um, talks about reasons for writing fragments um, mainly as being the impossibility of encompassing the subject in form. The subject is too beautiful, incredible, vast, and it cannot be encompassed. 
this rise of poetic endeavor. Um, fragments are an attempt that always fall, sh fall short and, and should. Um, he says, it is as if the interruption instigated by the poet's eye actually emphasizes the ceaselessness of what is seen, compulsively following what allows no leisure for interpretation or for shape. Um, he talks about awe as being a reason for writing in fragments, um, astonishment by awe. Um, and then uh, piety. Fragments, um, Ravel considers as always being pious, which I think is very related to the translatorly endeavor in many ways. Um, he says, the good fragment renouncing even the modest posterity of a completed utterance and choosing to exist not even once as a poem is innocent of presumption. It is transparent because it cannot be read in the usual manner of meaning received even once. Its illegibility is an inexhaustible necessity, which I think is wonderful when we're thinking about translation. Um, I quoted that in the panel description if I don't have it in front of them. Uh, it's, illegi its illegibility is an inexhaustible necessity. And I think uh, many of the panelists are working with original texts that are more or less illegible to begin with, which obviously poses many challenges and opportunities. Um, and then finally, I want to linger on this um, extremes of human experience. Uh, Ravel says is a, is a primary motivator for fragmentation. So uh, he says, at extremes of human experience, the habitual reflective syntax of language breaks, just as reflective consciousness breaks, opening to the catastrophe of a present that recalls no precedent and anticipates no aftermath. Poetic form is acquitted of intention when destroyed by life, by extremes of passion or grief, that compel poetry towards the speech of speechlessness, which, struggling to survive at those extremes, must encode the unnameable truth of catastrophe known not even to itself. A fragment can be the testimony of what did not escape to tell, but chose instead to remain at the site of the unspeakable and to speak there. And I think that applies to all of the fragments that we're going to be considering today. Um, by contemporary fragmentists. Um, and then uh, Ravel doesn't get into this so much, but along those lines, uh, there are political linguistic motivations for fragmentation, um, intentionally breaking language. You see this in Paul Ceylon, obviously, as a primary example, and that's something that some of the panelists will be covering as well. Um, and then uh, representation of history or historical trauma as a reason for, for fragmenting. And then finally, um, some of the panelists are going to be talking about uh, fragment, fragmentary citation, um, using fragments as a way of engaging with other texts in intertextual ways. So now I'm going to put on my panelist hat, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my translations of Miguel <coughs> Traditionally lineated uh, poems. 
so there's play with, with these forms. Um, but just to give you a sense of what um, the teeth look like, um, the 87 similar numbers, um, many of them are very short, um, but they also, um, it's fun, they also tend toward narrative at times and get into these little paragraphs of narration. Um, 
would be the third option. Um, so another site, another place. And um, Othra Barthe, Barthe is obviously the least specific way to kind of say this. And I realized that I think um, Gustav's choice of, of Barthe is very intentional. It's calling to mind for the reader that these are parts of a whole and that um, uh, Othra Barthe is really a kind of like a parallel universe where other things happen in the text and it's signaling to the reader to to look for that. Um, so in segment 62, which is fun, um, on television, St. George told of his duel with the dragon, but his proclaimed victory was a lie. At the same time, in another part, the dragon related his triumphs. Dragons are terrifying. Better to say yes, yes, yes. So there is a sense that in this parallel universe of another part, different things happen that negate those, those other things. Um, and then moving on, um, <coughs> another challenge in terms of trying to maintain that kind of consistency was the word olvido, which, um, um, so I've highlighted here, these are all places where um, in the original this word is olvido. It can be translated as, as forgetting generally would be like the typical Conversational translation, but it can also be translated more philosophically and into kind of cognate as oblivion. Um, and um, so I'm going to now contradict myself because I did not translate this consistently in all the places where it appears here. Um, but uh, there's a reason I did that. And so um, in fragment seven, when my father died, his oblivion was born. Again, it has this. this sense of paradox internally, which complicates the little aphoristic fragment. I really wanted that um, oblivion was born, which, you know, how can the oblivion be born? Um, in 16, the necessity of forgetting seeks the ghosts of the dead as lovers is exactly the opposite of what you would think, you know, if you're trying to forget someone who's died, would you not seek out a, a living person to help you forget as opposed to the ghosts of the dead? Um, and then uh, 54 is entirely long, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but forgetting is the memory of time. Obviously, it had to be forgetting the opposite of memory. Um, in 56, 69, and 78, um, I felt like those had to be oblivion because they're, they had to be consistent. They're the same kind of variations on the same statement. but. Um, dust and oblivion, which appears again and again, boards and oblivion, oblivion and dust. Um, there's a physical object being referred to, and then oblivion is the absence of, of an object. And then finally, um, the last place that this appears in Fragment 80, mud, clay, barren horizon, my father lost in oblivion. I wanted that to come full circle and to echo oblivion. Um, when my father died, his oblivion was born from that first fragment. And I realized when I pulled all these out that, um, so there's 87 fragments. The, the father and oblivion forgetting narrative begins in fragment seven and then it ends in fragment 80, which is kind of a fun mathematical pattern. And I'm wondering if, if I'll find more of those as I keep doing this. So anyway, um, that is that. And we're gonna move on now to Gada.
So with that in mind, if I was looking at uh, how can we translate this kind of writing, and I went back to my Bible of translation, which is Walter Benjamin, I said the best of a translator, and he also thinks that when we translate a text into another text, we should consider these two texts as fragments who fit into each other like two parts of a vessel. So here again, we have two fragments complementing each other's intentions. Um, and if we go back also to the theorization of fragmentation, I want to read again about fragmentation and fragments to see what, what it could also mean in order to contextualize this um, illegible text, many illegible text by clarity. And we, we are told by Maurice Blanchot that uh, fragments uh, make us read without looking for wholeness. They're not uh, a beginning of something that it's not a beginning. They're not supposed to lead to a wholeness. And then they don't have previous wholeness behind them. It's not that they were previously whole and they become fragmented now. They, are, they exist as fragments and we have to accept them as fragments. And as such, we shouldn't look for anything beyond or, or before. And from this perspective, they are juxtaposed in a text and not composed. So Kharitim was not composing in order to achieve a wholeness. He, he was just, just juxtaposing these fragments next to each other. And their relation with each other is also Sometimes it's complementary in some context, which I will go to now. And sometimes there are intention. Um, so in this arrangement, they are also expressing uh, a condition of exile because they are exiled from each other. But the relation to each other is a relation of an outsider to another outsider. So by, by keeping all these, um, Questions about fragments in mind. Um, I'll go to, to uh, the first poem, uh, Mutinies, and in the handouts you have you have also on the left the French, uh, the original. So if you look at the French, uh, when you see the je, which is the I, it's never even though it starts the, the, we start the sentence with the je, it's not capitalized. So I didn't capitalize that. I put the eyes all in um, a small letters, but I submitted it for translation, uh, for, for publication at Benipal, and the editor did not agree with me. They didn't like the small eye. They wanted a big eye. And yeah, so this whole discussion of the unsovereign eye that joined the unitary fabric and all this, um, they didn't like it. So they put it uh, as a capital letter. And what publication was that? Benny Paul. Benny Paul. Benny Paul. I didn't fight as I was supposed to fight. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up and let them capitalize all the eyes. Um, so if, if we go to the French, you will notice uh, the letters F, the uh, starting the consonation fondu comme la femme, fornication. So fondu, which means split, it refers to the, la femme, the woman, which is linked pretty much to fitna, which means also splitting, uh, fragmenting, uh, causing uh, tension in society. Fornication, instead of saying that's coupling or some fornication. And then naufragé, cast away. And we keep going down with, in the French, frappé. So all these starting with the F, letter F, uh, uh, associated with negative meaning as with fragmentation, which is by coincidence start with an F again. Affrété, um, le ferme, naf, sifflant, griffure down there. And he repeats the first uh, stanza down there with fondu, femme, fornication. As I went translating, I couldn't keep this F throughout the, the poem. So 
this continuation uh, was lost in the translation, but I could compensate it with something else, which is with the letter S. And it's also because, uh, so I will, I will go to the translated text, C, split, vices, novice, skin, screaming, C, skin again, slumber, star, C, sticks, face, and then split. So the split is introducing all these S. Um, so I, I hope by doing this that I would compensate for the loss of the S, which is like, a, like fondue. He starts it with fondue, which is splitting, and split, and the continuation of the S's to, to convey this sense of splitting fragmentation. Also, he introduces a lot of uh, Latinate words. Instead of using the common uh, terms for that, use the Latin, like, um, what is it? It's mostly in the second one. Let me, let me um, just mention, uh, toward the end, we have, so, um, in the original, we have uh, the satellite Dieu de Méandre de Minuit. That was a happy coincidence because I could satellite, could keep it, um, and Meander of Midnight. I could keep both Meander of Midnight, which were Meandre de Minuit. So um, I, I was able to see that. So I was thinking about. <coughs> Although he had this fragmentation, but there was something to refer to through the sound in his poems that I was working on, on keeping them while at the same time keeping what's foreign to, to French by using uh, uh, Latin, completely Latin words. So if we go to Sago, which is the name of a mountain, and I give uh, southeast of Morocco. Um, we have these um, advertis, which I, I get advertis, uh, letters, uh, the artists, so whatever he used as, uh, which mostly are names of uh, parasites and insects. And that's the Latin magical. Uh, terms for them, I kept them in the English. Uh, and I also worked on keeping the sound. Uh, I was able to keep most of the S sound here, um, but uh, let, let's look at the last one. So this was in the original Coutume inextricablement clair du temps. So you, you hear the sound of um, that cat sound, I was able to keep it inexplicably here custom of time. Another happy coincidence. But for the rest, um, yeah, I would like also to point out this. Um, that's, that was a, a very challenging moment here. In the original, it's a mid point d'interrogation frappe le ciel. Point the way he writes it with a G at the end is like the fist. But point d'interrogation is a question mark with point T. So it's, um, if I put it interrogation fist, it would lead also to the, the, the prison, the interrogation, the torture, or um, yeah, the, the physical violence. But if I put it in questioning fist, and my questioning fist, maybe it it leads to his own questioning, constant questioning of any orders he is encountering and resisting in life. So that was a, a, a difficult choice between, because he's also against political orders and any torture or, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I opted for questioning. I don't know what, what do you think about this. Um, I think I'll stop here. Thank you.
somebody in the back of the room, are there still some in the back of the room? Oh, the director's going to pass them out. Then we won't bother with the, with the technicality because I, technology, because I can't deal with it. And I don't want to make the same thing. Here, here. Thank you so much for organizing this. Um, I'm happy to talk about projects. Oh, so is it the one that with the blue paper clip is this? Yes. There are actually several colors of paper. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fragmentary presentation. Of um, I'm Susan. I wanted to be talking to you about two different projects that I worked on that both use fragments in a sort of constitutive way um, and how I went about translating them, thinking about them as fragments in the text. Um, some of this, for anyone who was at the punctuation panel, um, Yesterday, you've got a setup of this with, with um, Lisa Bradford's presentation, which you know involved punctuate a punctu a fragmentary punctuation problem. There's a lot of this in what I'm going to share with you. So the the two projects, the first of them is a book by Ludwig Harish, who's a German H A R I G. It was on the handout. Um, he's a well, he, he's somebody still alive, I hope, I think, um, who in the 60s was writing experimental fiction. And I translated a book of his for Rosemary Waldrop, uh, Burning Deck, called Die Reise nach Bordeaux, The Trip to Bordeaux, which is an experimental novel in 29 chapters, each of which is written in a different style. He is a translator into German of Ramon Cano, which explains a lot of things. So he's a translator author himself who's very interested in, you know, he translated Cano's exercises and style into German. And so, four of, and Bordeaux, home of Hodelin, home, home of Montaigne, four of his, of his, the chapters out of these 29 are Montaigne chapters, and I Xeroxed one page out of my translation. The preliminaries of Monsieur de Montaigne. Um, and I discovered in, well actually let me just read a little bit of this and then I'll tell you what the deal is. My chapter headings were not released into the world by the indeterminacy of the word hawk in the theory of transubstantiation. These <laughs> anecdotes and the many quotes contained in them are not always plain examples and do not always exhaust their subject matter much as in the case of a man who, meeting fire, visits his neighbor to obtain some. I sometimes lose my thread, if not the lap robe. I prefer the sort of gait familiar in poetry with unexpected leaps, whether it be on horseback, at table, or in bed. Either since I myself am one person one day, another on another, front and back, facing left and right, and in all my natural attitudes, but especially on horseback, where I engage in my most protracted conversations. If you're having a little difficulty following this, it's because what you are reading is a bunch of Montaigne quotes. Um, and it took me a little while, because this book was written in German, to figure out that this chapter consisted 100% of Montaigne quotes. The only problem was that Harvard did not quote full sentences at a time, but quoted third of sentences, half of sentences, bits of sentences, but there's basically no words in this that did not come out of a Montaigne essay. Um, and so once I figured that out, <laughs> because I, you know, I read a bunch of Montaigne to prepare for doing this book because I knew Montaigne was a big part of it, and I started to recognize fragments. Once I figured that out, I thought, okay, let me just translate this as if it were just written as one thing. And the really interesting thing I discovered in doing this is that it was almost impossible for me to translate this collage of fragments without normalizing it and creating meaning. I found it incredibly difficult to not create meaning, which completely destroyed the effect. And then I thought, what am I going to do? Because this is not interesting. If it doesn't fulfill the constraints, also the things were blurring into one another, right? The, the, the part, because you know, when you re recast a complicated sentence, sometimes things wind up in a different order in English. So you know, the fragments were blurring together. It was a mess. And so I wound up doing the following. I had. These, um, I had all these quotes. I was able to separate out where one began and one ended. Um, and then I took the, this was before, I did this in the you know, early 90s. The internet was not what it was today. 
Um, so I, I was working in Berlin in the Staatsbibliothek, a big, great library with a wonderful, big, well-stocked reference room. And using this ref in this reference room, I found an enormous concordance, a concordance in French of the complete works of Montaigne, in which, I mean, most of you, everybody, all of the people in the room who are my age and older probably know what a concordance is, but I think with the internet, concordances are, lose, are you know, losing in favor, so the younger people in the room may never have seen a concordance, but before the internet and before searchable texts, people, scholars used to assemble these large books that would be, you know, the works, along with the works of Shakespeare, you look up the word problem, <coughs> And you know, someone's made a list of every time the word problem appears in Shakespeare's work. So it was a scholarly tool. So I used this concordance of, Mont of Montaigne's works to find where each one of these fragments came from. So I looked at the German. I tried to get find key words in it and figure out what that key word in German would have been in French, found it in the French concordance, and then looked it up in an old, I used the Cohen translation of Montaigne because I liked its slight um, um, old-fashioned tone looked up the fragments in the English and then cut and pasted and collaged. So this is a collage of the Cohen translation of Montaigne because I was unable to create the fragment feel by just translating it straight up. And so I used this translation technique, which took no more hours than you can possibly imagine. Um, okay, that's, that's the hardest part of this presentation, which I know. Um, now we're going to back. So the most recent book of hers, that she's a really, really great um, German writer in her late, late 40s now. Um, and I'm going to be talking about her book, The End of Days, which is a book that's, um, I have to give away a little bit of plot, but I, it doesn't make sense if you don't know the basics of this book. Um, so it's a book that keeps retaking history. And so the main character of the book dies as an infant on the first page. And the book keeps telling you history and then taking it back with a what if. You know, the baby dies and then you read about all the horrible things that happen to the family as a result of the death of this child, which includes deaths and immigrations and you know all the incredible consequences that one deed can have or one event can have. The book then says, but what if instead of blah, instead of when the baby started crying like this, and then it occurred to the mother to, you know thrust open the window, grab a handful of snow, and put it under the baby's shirt. Then the baby's heart would start to beat, blah, blah. You get this what if that, so that turns into the narrative you're reading over and over again. And so we have these many, many lives, which however you forget about where you're reading, so each time it happens, even if you're expecting it, it's a little bit of a shock. But so our main character who died on the first page winds up a middle-aged woman who has fled Nazi Germany because she's a Marxist. Um, she also has Jewish roots, so she's doubly endangered. And she's living in Moscow, um, where a lot of people from Germany and Austria have fled out of political conviction, only to find themselves shortly thereafter victims of, the, of Stalin's show trials. Um, so she's in this horrible position. Her husband has been taken away. And she's writing, she's writing in the course of this chapter an account of her life. She has to account for herself. And this account of her life must be submitted to the authorities. She's written several accounts of her lives, and each one of them was sort of politically expedient. And she's thinking about, if I write this, what's it going to do? What's it going to do? Um, and she starts to have a lot of memories of her political experiences, which get broken down into fragments. And fragments are really important in Jenny Erkenbeck's life, or sorry, work, because I think that having this is the fourth book of hers I've translated, so I feel like I know her work pretty well now. I think that she believes, it seems to be the case from her work, that she believes that um, if you break down everybody's lives into sorts of incidents and events that happen, all lives become like one another in there, you know, with minus the trappings, but in the sorts of things that happen. And like, here, here's a quote from her work. Um, now it's like this, and this is from the end of a, of a, of a random chapter. Um, now it's like this. The one hand knows that a man's member doesn't hurt when you squeeze it, even applying a fair bit of pressure. It's just a muscle. Another hand has known for a long time that caution is required when pouring water over the kasha in a pot, because the water can splash up and possibly scald you. 
One hand grasps the handle of a drill in a factory 800 times a day. One hand washes the other. Another gets slipped through a person's hair. Another drops a quarter into a gas meter. One hand pulls a sheet taut. Another wipes crumbs from the table. A third flips a light switch. And in this little you know, montage of hands, she's retold, given a resume of the lives of like five different characters in the book that we've had, and she sort of distilled their lives into the thing, the, the, thing, the gestures a hand performs. Um, and then the, for the point I made about lives being all in some strange way the same life, here's a short quote about that, gestures as shared experience. She thought, that it, she thought at times that deprivation made people more alike, made their movements down to the gestures of their hands and fingers ever more predictable. When she encountered other people in the woods who were also looking for wood, because you're, you're freezing in, in wartime, in wartime outside of Vienna, other people looking for wood, she saw their bending over, their breaking twigs, their stripping off the dry leaves, exactly resembling her own bending, breaking, and stripping. And so how do you survive a war? You go out into the woods and you bend, break, and strip. So you know these are, these are the, the gestures. And so there's a thematic link um, in this book between these isolated gestures and the whole and the story of you know political history, human history, 20th century history in the German-speaking countries that she's telling the history of the world is a series of wor the world is a series of moments, and each of these moments leaves physical marks behind on bodies and muscle memory. These things. So she's mapping this pattern of marks. So I, I'm give, I've given you a couple of pages which you can actually ignore or you can look at if you want to. Um, from the Moscow chapter, I gave it to you in German in case some of you know German. If you want to sit there and check my translation, you can talk about that excruciating label later or we can skip that. Um, that's excruciating, as you will. Um, but I wanted you to see that there are a bunch of fragments. And even if you don't know any German, look at page 164 and 165. All of these things on the left-hand side of the page on 164 are fragments, and at the top of 165, you see that they're getting shorter. That's the only thing that, that I, I want you to note at this point. So lots and lots of fragments getting pr progressively shorter. It turns out, because I asked Jenny, what's going on this, on this page? Um, all of these fragments are quoted from an actual book that existed in German called Die Säuberung. Moscow, 1936. The Zoyberhof is the cleansing, Moscow in 1936. So it's talking about the show tries. Um, Stenogram einer geschlossenen Parteiversammlung. It, these are, this is, it's the transcript, the protocol of a closed party meeting in which all the Marxist German language writers in Moscow were having a meeting in which they're talk, they're basically jockeying for position and figuring out how to, you know, one cleanse their ranks to keep them as a body safer. So there were, you know, victim, sacrificial victims in this. And on the other hand, you know, strategize how do we present ourselves to the authorities? You know, very a very fraught situation. And people who were present in these, if you go and look at the book, like I did, the people who were present were people like Georg Lukacs, Johannes R. Becher, who was like, you know became one of the most celebrated poets in East Germany, Friedrich Wolf, um, so you know, known figures. Um, and they are arguing about their political position and who is politically clean and who is not and what that means. And so she's taken from these protocols fragments out of context in such a way that they don't necessarily, sometimes they answer each other and sometimes they don't. It's, it's, it becomes about the gesture of survival. Um, and so keeping, keeping the fragments, she's, she's just still in, you don't even see what they're talking about. She, you just get the rhetorical gestures in a sense. And so like, like her gestures of gathering wood, there are the gestures of ensuring one's political survival in this very dangerous environment. The same bit is in English on the pages marked 138 and 140, which are on separate pages because I'm technologically, you know, not quite as sharp as I could be. Um, I guess I can, I'll read a couple of these. 
So at the top of 138, this was a weekend in early spring, perhaps around Easter, a leg outside Berlin. Utterly disgraceful, someone should put a stop to it, such a ne'er-do-well. We wanted to paddle across on our kayak, serves him right. I remember that the weather was not on our side that day, turned out to lack all talent. So, and by the end of page 138, you know, tried to incite me to his solid, almost stocky figure, to say that the book is garbage. We're down to shorter and shorter phrases that have ever less coherence to them. You may notice that um, some, some of these have sprouted ellipses in English that were not there in the German. Why did Susan translate in the ellipses? Um, I'm with you. Um, sometimes I don't want to pick too many fights with my editors. Um, my edit the editor of this book was distressed by all the fragments and said people will not be able to follow this. Um, and somehow I was able to convince him that people not being able to follow entirely was part of the point and that the reader would probably be able to go with the flow. And we compromised rather than turning all rather than putting too much sense making. I, sometimes you have to give your editor things that the editor wants. Mm -hmm. Because I was fighting other battles too. And if you, if you fight every battle to the death, you wind up damaging your relationship with your editor to such a point that it's not really good. Um, and so sometimes you compromise a little. I hope, I decided that this compromise was not the sort of compromise that would make me have you know, hang my head in shame for the rest of my life. Uh, you may disagree, we could discuss that. But um, I agree to some ellipses. And the ellipses are a physical signal to the reader, hey, these are fragments, which I think the reader probably knew anyway, and the German reader has a say in sort of. So it goes. At the top of page 140, um, <clears throat> here, well, I'll just read that, the, the top of that page. With the roller to the side of her typewriter, so we're back to back to her writing the report that may determine her life or death, right? With the roller to the side of her typewriter, she scrolls back up the last eight lines, then strikes the X key over and over until the paragraph she's just written becomes illegible. Then she goes on writing, active in, while fighting, journey to, at work on, he, he, and she. And so the, the words of her report are also turned into these gestures, um, just like in the, 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 the transcript of the, of the party fighting. Um, and those my editor did not fight me on, which I was very happy about, because I think the reader gets it that it was very important to keep these fragments, you know, feeling fragmentary, because um, that's part of the point, and that's all I have to say. Thanks.
was responsible, they say, for the death of only 650 young women. And the text, from a translator's point of view, presents a number of challenges because it is a palimpsest of other citations that Pizarnik is engaging with as a poet. So thinking about the poetic fragment in Blood Countess is, is a way of being forced to think about questions of tribute, of intertextuality, of citation, of ambiguity, and even of plagiarism. Because the strange thing about Blood Countess is that it began originally as a book review. Someone said, review La Comtesse Sanglante by Valentin Penrose, which came out when Pizarnik was living in Paris. So imagine you're a young poet, and you're trying to make money as a book reviewer. You take this text, you start reading it, and you start quoting, taking notes of passages that you want to talk about in your review, the underlying phrases. And let's just say it so happens that this is a book that moves you so completely that you almost don't know what to do with it. You might write a text like Blood Countess. So if you look at the passages that I, that I give you, you can see a, a progression in the tone, starting with the first fragment, with the first section, which is the opening passage of the text that has this kind of critical tone. So what I saw as I started translating this text, a text that I avoided for so long because it is very difficult and gory to, to hear and read about so much torture, violence, rape, murder of these women, was that the, the prose is very different from his artists and I resisted it. I actually hated this book for the longest time and I postponed it as much as I could. But I knew that it was important and so I kept coming back to it, trying to like it and failing. So I thought maybe if I read Penrose's text, I'll have a better insight into what gripped Pizarnik so much. So I read Penrose very slowly in French. I read the translation by Alexander Trochi. And then I went back to Pizarnik. And I saw these uh, skeletal, residual uh, fragments that helped me figure out what she was doing. And then I was stunned by the text. Because you can see narratively how the, the fragments that she chooses to italicize from Penrose's book start to create something entirely different, transforming the text into something else almost vampirically. And if you look at the first section, it opens with a quote by Jean Paul Sartre, and Pizarre writes, Valentine Penrose has collected various sources and accounts concerning the Countess Bathory, a real but larger than life figure who murdered over 650 young women. Fine. She's writing a book review, and it sounds critical. The language of that section is very formal. Fourth paragraph. She's, third paragraph. Countess Bathory's madness and sexual perversity are so self evident that Valentine Penrose has set these issues aside and focuses entirely on the convulsive beauty of her subject. To show us this kind of beauty is no easy task, but Valentine Penrose has managed to do it and plays admirably with the more aesthetic qualities of this dark history. Ercebet Bathory's subterranean realm is inscribed here in the torture chamber of her medieval castle. And if you don't know the background of this text, you think, why is subterranean realm italicized? in the Spanish or in the English translation. And you, the, the impulse is to emphasize it, the subterranean realm, but you don't know why exactly. But that's a quote that she's building her book review on. After reading this text many times, you go back and you see that in the paragraph above, however, where she says the convulsive beauty of her subject, convulsive is also taken from Penrose but it's not cited. There's no uh, acknowledgement that this is Penrose's language. So that already should make the, the rereader begin to wonder. As the, as the text progresses, you, you develop this very prismatic narrative of the Countess's life. And it's 
further you get into the story, the more Penrose's language starts to take over the text. Because if you look at the second fragment or section that I've offered you on the lethal cage, something shifts here. It says, this is talking about a, 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 a torture method that the Countess uses. I won't read it out loud at this point for time, but the, the middle of the paragraph reads, in italics, the lady of these ruins appears, etc. And here again, she's quoting Penrose with a purpose of elucidating the, 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 the poetical beauty of this very grim biography. And I find it a haunting phrase. On a third read, it's an even more haunting phrase because I have figured out, much like Susan figured out, that almost that entire piece, the lethal cage, comes from Penrose. Mm. That Pizarnik has sort of uh, stepped back from and rewritten or retold. Mm. Throughout the passage, she uses Penrose's structure, narrative structure, phrasing, but repurposes it in some way. And it feels like plagiarism sometimes, but it also feels like like a beautiful homage, and it can also sound very different knowing that Pizarnik is engaging with this French text, translating it into Spanish, creating her own Spanish prose out of it, and then physically changing uh, translations for her own purpose. So when I submitted this to my editor, I, or when I started to write the note that accompanied the translation, I said, to make things simple and to give a reader a sense of the thick intertextuality in this translation, I have tried scrupulously to adhere to the excellent English translations of this book. And I feel very proud of myself because it was hours of research and hours of intense engagement with this very gory story. It felt like watching episode after episode of Snapped, you know, and where you see the, the, the text of some newspaper article and several key words are highlighted to show how crazy the subject is. Um, but by the time I sent the email, I knew that that could no longer be sustained as, a, as, a, as an effective strategy for the translation, particularly because Pizarnik then goes on and changes so much. So, How much time do we have? I, I feel guilty because I think we're on the edge of the... No, you're fine. Yeah. Um, it's like another five minutes. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you turn to the third section, to Black Magic, uh, this was a place where using this method, a very faithful uh, citation from the existing English translation wasn't effective. Because here Pizarnik is herself translating a text, and she says, I'll read, the magic herbs, I'm reading at the bottom of the first page. The magic herbs, the spells, the amulets, even the blood baths, all of it held a medicinal function for the countess. To arrest her beauties that it could remain forever for the magic hmm. And this was a pitfall already, because I knew that Comme de Pierre wasn't from Penrose. It's very clearly from there that she's quoting, you know, the, the whole text is so full of quotes that for Pizarnik suddenly to give the Baudelaire citation the importance of Penrose's text of texts, to quote him the way she quotes Penrose, suddenly made my theory fall apart. That somehow this mixture of readings had to be addressed differently. So knowing that helped me, or made me start to question my my approach to this. She goes on. This amulet she wore close to her heart beneath her luxurious gowns, and sometimes in the middle of a party she would reach for it surreptitiously. Here is my translation of the prayer. And now tra Pizarnik translates, but really modifies the passage that she initially used as a citation. So another layer of problematic citation occurs here. And it's never really credited anywhere. Um, 
and throughout the passages, uh, that ambiguity is maintained. We don't know who is speaking. Uh, in the final section, on the bottom of the page, we never deny Thurzo's accusations. She says, the Countess declared that, quote, all of that was within her right as a noble woman of high rank, to which the pal Palatine's response was essentially, I condemn you to life imprisonment within your own castle. And in this case, the phrase, all of that was within her right as a noble woman of high rank, is a direct citation from the Penrose text. But the second italicization, I condemn you, etc., that's just Pizarnik. I tell Sison herself, making <laughs> a dialogue to perform this incredibly critical moment within the story. So it's almost as if she's saying, I am taking Penrose's text, appropriating it, and then I'm giving you my text and quoting myself. You do something different with it. Um, <laughs> and nice. it's very moving to engage with this brutal text like that. Um, what I sense is this incredible tension between the epigraphs and the text. And what I find that, I mean, one of the questions in the, in the description of this panel was to consider the reverberations of poetic fragment. And to me, the, the italics seem to perform a, a very special function. They're like residues or skeletal remains that, in a sense, tell you this, or, or somehow mark this moment of convulsive creative creation in, in literary texts, where, or rather, it shows the, the complex relationship between reading and writing and translating. Here is this moment where a book really grips you, and you start to write something, and then it transforms, into something else entirely. I've never seen a text that does exactly that. So I find it beautiful to think of these italics that used to bug me so much as these kind of uh, highlighted passages that say, this is pointing to an act, a process, a performance of reading and writing that has to be acknowledged that is part of all our work. I, I find myself, uh, I, I, I find my voice trembling saying this because I think it is something very personal. But to see how a, a text can go from being so inscrutable and so re and something that you resist as a translator to something that is so um, <coughs> instructive for this work you know, has made the 100 hours it took to translate this into 16 pages really worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all. So I want to thank all of the panelists so much for presenting these gorgeous fragments and insights to all of us. And we are actually at time. Um, there's a beverage break now. I think there's lunch time. So we can uh, continue to take questions if you'd like. Lisa. I have questions. Yes, I've dealt with the same problem of citation in Translators are uh, forced to do all of our research. We, we have to find out who's being cited, where, and why. Um, you know, I, I call it myself generative translation. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, what you're saying here is that there's been a work that has generated this work afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one as a translator, one time, I know, I know. You know, we want to go practice all these talk about it, but at the end of the day, the person who read those texts. In Spanish, had no idea um, who, that, that Saint Teresa said that. You know, it's just a beautiful poem. And um, just wonder if you thought about. I'm sure you thought about. It, but what do, you, what do you want to say about how the original readers took those? They didn't even realize they were generative yeah. translations. I don't. I don't. Never, I, I don't mark them. I let them go unnoticed in the. Do, I mean, you have footnotes for our use, but do you? I no, mean, I mean, I'm not using footnotes at the at this stage. 
I, I, what, I, what I've decided to do is write an introductory essay explaining what is happening. And, but I think Pizarnik, who would use footnotes in different contexts, resists doing so in the original publications of these texts. And I, I kind of honor that um, because it seems that she's saying everything that you, that, that you write is full of all these things that you read. And it, it's nice to know that that's Baudelaire, but you don't really have to know. It's um, a short answer. She was a translator of French. I mean, uh, she spent a lot of her time in Paris translating Michaud and Artaud and, you know, Baudelaire, uh, doing this work at, at UNICEF, I think, UNESCO, sorry. And I think part of it was that she was trying to make money and probably got some commission. But also, I think she was translating poetry to learn her chops as a writer. She was incredibly erudite, and she would copy all these texts that she loved into a notebook, her Palais de Vocabulaire. She collected it, and then she would take phrases and fragments and create these very tight prose poems. Yeah. Can we just follow up with something that was interesting, what you just said, that practice is a medieval practice, right? That mm -hmm. you would take uh, passages, copy passages, some sense memorize them and then they became part of your language. And, and maybe all of you going back to Sappho, this and further, uh, that this idea of, of a fragment of citation, what the boundary is, um, that the way any creative work maybe is part of a fragment of a larger tradition, even maybe a set kind of literary vocabulary, right? That this intentional writing in terms of fragmentation is just a simplification or a revelation of the way literature has always really been uh, written and performed and enacted. I mean, it's, it's just, in some sense just a different, more obvious form. I know that sounds like I'm not denigrating, but I'm not, but uh, of, of something that's a process that's always happened in, in literary creation. Yeah, I mean, as far I can speak to this a little bit, as far back as Homer, I mean, the, the term rhapsode for those poets who, who you know, uh, recite and improvise on Homeric poetry out of the Homeric cycle and tradition. Uh, I mean, they, they were called stitchers. Uh, the, the image behind it being that they're they're putting cobbling together, you know, swaths, right, uh, and of narrative, but also down at the verbal level. I mean, just phrases that might be two epithets and nouns, or 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 or, uh, or single hexameter lines and integrating them, and then cobbled together in exciting new ways that was allowed and preferred in antiquity. We want a text today. We want the Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and we have these textual editions, right, to try to get back to what was exactly right. But in antiquity, uh, it was the oral performance, and you wanted something fresh and new. Tragedians meant to innovate on myth, and so even at the mythological level, there's a cobbling that's going on uh, outside just the purely verbal structure. So yes. <laughs> I mean, you, you remind me of something I read in Rosalind Morris's book. She's this professor of anthropology at Columbia. She wrote a, place, a book called In the Place of Origins. And there's this beautiful section talking about how in Thai poetics, part of the coming of age of a poet is to uh, create a palette of a vocabulary, gleaning words from different regional languages that are then, then given the aura of being part of that poet's vocabulary. And I think Pizarnik would probably say something like, writing poetry is a practice and a process of knowledge. And every poem is a kind of collection of knowledge in some way. Um. Sergio. Um, yeah, I, have, um, I really enjoyed the panel. And I was wondering, it's to whoever whoever feels like you can say something about it. At what point is it, I think I heard it I heard it the other one both people. At what point is a fragment a part of a whole? And at what point is a fragment indicative that there is no whole? Uh, and 
to what extent are you seeing translation always as a fragment of the source, of the source culture and language groups of words in the time? So I guess so I guess it's sort of a big problem. Does it have to be a dichotomy? Does it have to be one or the other? Because I think I think fragments usually both work in both directions at once. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that a little bit in terms of what I worked on. Um, I I wanted to allow them to to work in both directions, so I really focused on making sure that each individual fragment stood on its own as it not as a whole, but as a piece that reverberates and that is suggestive of something larger than itself outside of itself but then also that those reverberations is echoes that um, pick up other fragments throughout the text and suggest that they're approaching a wholeness but that that wholeness is never going to be realized but to allow the reader to to kind of imagine it as a potential I don't think there's a lot of literary works out there that really celebrate wholeness, except maybe, you know, Walt Whitman. Is, isn't mm. most of literature about, you know, breakdown and fragmentation anyway? I don't know. I'm going to fragment the panel. I'm really sorry. I have to go to a committee meeting. But um, okay. carry on without me. <laughs> yeah, the translation of the sapphic, the stuff that fascinates me for that very reason, just whether we want to insist on its fragmentary nature or we uh, move forward and sort of try to construct something that's a poem in its own right. Uh, where the translator becomes his author. You know, the fragment I use as an, as an example, it doesn't appear in a, a lot of translated editions of Sappho at all. It Barnstone gives it a whole page, but Josephine Balmer doesn't have it, and her, she, her, her, her edition's called The Complete Works of Sappho, which is already sort of an oxymoron, right? <laughs> so. I don't know how to answer your question, <laughs> but um, it's, it's a... A beautiful and important one. Um, I I think in the in in the Pizarnik, uh, she's leaving uh, vestigial traces of process that says nothing that I write is ever going to be what I want it to be, and and yet I think she's more interested in saying look at this new different thing I can make, this transformation of one thing is into another, and that's, I think, very life-affirming in the work. I can say one thing about um, translation as a fragment. Uh, after I started translating, um, and that sometimes I have to make choices, mm -hmm. whenever I read a translated text, I feel this fragmentation. It's like I need to read the source to see what was the original term? What was the original intention? Is it is it actually a choice that translation a uh, translator made, or was it? Yeah, there's always this in the back of my mind, and this gives me the feel of fragmentation in any translation. Thank you all so much. Thank you.